I think the reason I've been asked to talk is I've spent um, most of my career running research studies of various sorts um, in low-income settings and very much in partnerships with, um, with, with groups um, in the field and running a large amount of capacity and um, training initiatives within those communities trying to increase uh, research capacity in, in the middle-income settings. Um, so it's that experience I'm trying to impart a little bit of today and some of the efforts um, we're collectively making in trying to enhance the amount of research that's happening in um, the world's poorest regions. So um, why do we do it? Why do we need clinical research? Well, um, we need to, um, to make change in many health outcomes, don't we? And obviously in the world's poorest areas, we've got the biggest burdens of disease. Um, and where there's the biggest burdens of disease, we've got the greatest opportunity to, to make changes. Um, <coughs> So, and to make change, we need evidence to drive that change. So much of what happens um, in many settings in developing countries is, is based on practice and, and not evidence, and it, and it becomes habitual, or it's based on guidelines or, or programmes that are written elsewhere in the world and, and applied. We were talking about just lunchtime, weren't we, with them? So various drugs and regimens that are used um, are often not based on locally acquired evidence. Um, but it's not, it's not just drugs and vaccines. It's things like... Um, better hygiene practices or um, treating pneumonia at home in the hospitals. There's all sorts of different situations where you need evidence to work out what's the best way to do something. Um, and and you, you need the tools of clinical research to, to do that. And I'll, I'll come on to different types of clinical research studies that you can use in this, in this quest. But, but underlying all of this, um, we talk in our group quite a lot about equity and access to, to research. Um, and when I talk about that, I, I mean in terms of people who work in healthcare having the opportunity to, to use the benefits of research, both in evaluating evidence and in conducting research and taking part in research and benefiting from that in their own careers and their own personal development, but also being able to make impact um, in the patients' lives who they see every day. Um, but also for the community to be able to benefit from that evidence and, and engage in researchers. Um, and we just talked about earlier, being part of the process of doing research, but then obviously in a much wider context, benefiting from the data that's, that's generated by doing the research. And, you know, in, in Oxford and in Brighton and in London and in, in um, Seattle, wherever you want to pick in the developed world, there's a vast amount of research going on all the time. It's almost second nature that people um, you know, probably don't even have to have an awareness of to notice it's going on. But that's just so far from the truth everywhere else in the world. But that's where we need the data. So um, this is really where I'm coming from with this. So Gail asked me to talk about um, why we need to do this research. And then obviously in the, the context of the ethical challenges of, of doing research in these settings. So I thought I'd just try and describe what the landscape is now. What type of research is going on in these places. I'm, I'm sure many of you in the room are very experienced in working in these settings, um, but just to give you a bit of breath. Um, in places like um, India there's, and China, um, Brazil, increasingly across Africa, there's um, a large amount of industry-run trials going on, um, contract research organisation running studies, and that is a really, really good thing. It's really good because they're bringing investment, they're training people, they're getting new drugs and vaccines in, and that's absolutely fantastic. There's also... Um, a reasonable amount of um, academic studies that are going on in many settings that are led by Wellcome Trust Fellowships, the Gates Foundations, NIH and so on. Also very good news. Um, and there's lots of other sort of in-between things going on between the product development partnerships that are developing drugs and vaccines we all need and work with. Um, right through to um, some charities doing research. Um, we had Manisa earlier today talking to us, um, organisations like Drugs and Neglected Disease Initiative. All absolutely excellent. Um, and to be congratulated and supported wherever we possibly can. But there is a huge sort of, you know, wrong end of the curve um, about who's, who's leading these studies and where they're being generated from. And as I said, externally sponsored trials, as I'm terming the sort of drug and vaccine, most people think about research in developing countries being, you know, drug and vaccine trials to bring us new treatments and the HIV vaccines we heard about this morning. Um, I've spent a lot of my career working on malaria drugs and malaria vaccines, so I threw the thing in about HIV research this morning. But, but it's all good, it's all good. We need all that investment and we need that mix. 
and, and I'm definitely being devil's advocate because I think yeah, absolutely the HIV world has paved the way in a lot of senses. Um, the, the landscape in the last 15 years or so that I've been working in, um, in developing countries has changed immensely. You know, it's, it's the norm now to run regulatory standard um, clinical trials in these settings and there's the skills on the ground to do it and that's incredible. And that's come because of this huge investment from, um, from the public and private sector. Um, it's brought infrastructure, it's brought training, it's brought awareness, um, and it's sorted out lots of things like, um, you know, I first met Adam doing ethics committee training, didn't I, in Addis about three years ago, which was um, a, a, a sort of joint initiative with lots of organisations. You need those sorts of infrastructures to do these sorts of things. However, the other side of it is that we also need much, much more locally-led research. Um, and we need this now, and as well as everything else, to address local disease uh, management questions. So I tend to turn these as disease management studies. So it's excellent to do um, a cutting edge phase three regulatory trial where you're gathering data for an FDA submission on a HIV or malaria vaccine, brilliant. But it'd be also good next door in the maternity ward where you might have 20% matern maternal mortality to go and talk to those midwives and healthcare workers who are on the ward or out in the regions and, and trying to manage their daily experience of, of trying to support these mothers and, and, the, and the young babies and think, okay, how can we equip these healthcare workers with the skills and resources and really importantly the mandate to engage in research and understand why research and evidence is so important. So lots of the focus in, in my experience, do this for a long time, is, is on the clinicians and on these big drugs and vaccine projects, all good. But we need to broaden that much more and, and think of all the frontline healthcare workers um, that um, should be engaged in research and aren't. They need, they need skills, they need support, they need um, access to training. And it's, it's the whole spectrum of evidence, from even being able to evaluate evidence that's out there already, or decide whether the things that they're using every day in their clinical practice, is that based on evidence or, or is it just something they've come to do? And then to think about what they're doing, what they could change and then how they could evaluate that. You know, can you test one thing against another and see if it works? Um, so what, what are the barriers? Um, we were out in Ethiopia recently, we did a nice workshop um, with some healthcare, um, some public health people and doctors and nurses and all sorts. And you ask people about, you know, what, what stops you doing research? And people don't think it's for them. They, took, they say, oh, well, that's for you foreigners. You know, it's not for us. It's, for, um, it's perceived as being really expensive, out of reach, uh, that other people, have to, other people come in and do research. And it, it shouldn't be like that. Um, it, simple research, pragmatic research, doesn't need to be expensive or difficult. Um, and it's, it's a case of getting the skills out there. Um, Populations are hard to, to access, and healthcare is hard to access. Um, my colleagues in Kenya um, do, have done some fantastic research about the decisions that women have to take <coughs> to get their children to a hospital and how many days that takes, and the, the <coughs> long journeys and experiences, and persuading the husband or number one wife to let them get their kids to healthcare. So you're working in that situation and that whole um, setting. It's it, it's hard to get to the people who need to have the research. Um, conducted with them, in partnership with them, um, so it's hard to, to, the whole thing is difficult because you're working in those settings. In, in countries with um, such low investment per capita in healthcare per year, it's really hard to convince governments to put money into research um, against everything else that they're being um, asked to pay for, from vaccination programmes to bed nets to central drugs. Um, trying to get any of that proportion from research is a really tall order. Um, and so we do rely on lots of external funding um, to make that work. Um, logistics and practicalities uh, are, are obvious. You know, if we're trying to do um, some of the um, either interesting basic epidemiology studies um, or, or even the, the more complex vaccine trials, sometimes we need to, to get um, to blood samples moved around. And you need, if you want to do some immunology, for example, you sometimes need to get the blood samples from where you took the blood in the rural districts to somewhere where there's a lab you can spin them down and you maybe you've only got a two three hour window so that obviously limits where you can work and um, we spend a lot of time doing training and capacity developments and it's it's obviously not just in sitting 
with the clinical teams trying to talk about research, but it's with ethics capacity training, um, teaching about research governance, trying to put infrastructures into hospitals and universities to teach about research, to do research um, management, budgets, the whole shebang. It's not, you know, there's such a wide variety of things you need to accompany, um, you know, a good research culture in, in any situation. Um, so I just wanted to give you an example of a couple of studies um, that I've been involved with in the last couple of years, just to, to show you um, a bit of a variety in what can happen. This is um, a study called the Feast Trial that um, we did in, in East Africa. The, the situation with this was that um, children were coming to a ward um, in, in, any, in any of these settings, and unconscious, very sick, because they'd gone through the process of going to the local district health facility um, in the rural areas and then eventually get into hospital um, and they'd be unconscious and need treatment. But the, um, the protocols would be, you know, what to do if a child has malaria, what to do if a child has pneumonia, what to do if a child has sepsis. You would never ever know. 20% of those children will die within the first um, 14 hours of presenting. Nobody ever knows what these children have. So the, the question is what to do with them immediately to, do, to, to, to resuscitate the children in this situation. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to go into the, sort of, you know, the outcomes of the study and how, how we did it, but it was just the fact that we did do it. And, and, in this, and I'll have you talk about coffee and, or look up the study if you want to read more about it. But it, it was basically trying to decide what possible interventions could help just to try and equip the healthcare workers with something they could do to, as soon as these children presented um, and to try and to, to work out the best strategy. It's very challenging doing um, clinical trials in emergency settings and we came up with lots of solutions like um, deferred consent because the parents were distressed and we had to act quickly. Um, and it's just a very good example. Of that this was a very complicated trial in a very challenging setting. And we were doing things like capillary refill times, squeezing the finger to look at um, blood flow because there's no machines to monitor um, patient um, that there would be in the UK. You know, there's no big um, monitors and things. So it was trying to do a study in that setting. Um, the complete other end of the spectrum, but an equally equally eloquent study, was um, patients on HIV. So I do approve HIV research. Um, this was a um, very simple situation that the, there was a big rollout of antiretroviral treatments in um, in uh, Cameroon, um, but quite a low um, adherence to therapy. So um, a team of uh, local Cameroon uh, researchers wanted to see if they could improve antiretroviral therapy compliance by sending text messages to um, the patients. So half the patients would get the text messages and the other half didn't. A beautiful randomised trial um, to try a very simple pragmatic intervention. It was cheap, not expensive, highly effective. So just, just two very contrasting examples of um, cl cl complex um, clinical trials or a simple question, but both using the clinical trial tool to ask locally pragmatic and relevant questions. So Clinical research is absolutely important, both for improving management and practices, but also for bringing new treatments, prevention and, and practices. Um, far, there's far too um, little evidence-based practice in many of, of these settings, uh, right from disease outbreaks to refugee camps to day-to-day -day things like maternal health. Um, and, we, and we don't engage the communities enough in research and give them the opportunity to take part. The other thing we've... Um, we know very well from experience that we don't do enough to, um, to measure and publish. And this is a plea or a research opportunity for lots of people. Um, putting research into health facilities raises standards. Um, we've seen this time and time again, and it, it brings all sorts of um, systems and, and useful tools um, that can help just improve standards overall. Um, and so that's a sort of added benefit, if you like. But when I'm giving training courses um, in these places, and I'm talking to, to midwives or health workers or nurses or doctors, I always say to them that it's, you know, the day-to-day -day clinical practice you engage in is, is obviously really important and life-changing for the patients. But when you do a research study and you gather data, that, that data, I think you've done within that, could impact thousands of lives from that point forward. So it's, it, it's a huge responsibility and a privilege, but it's, it's so drastically important. Um, so just to finish off, this is what we're trying to do in a small way to, to help this. Um, you know, we live in a sharing society now with um, things like, um, you know, Facebook and, um, you know, LinkedIn and all these online systems. And 
These will work because of something called community of practice, which is where a group of people experiencing an issue get together to share it. Um, and this has been applied in many, many um, settings internationally, um, mainly commercial. And, and so we're trying to apply this to, to global health and trying to improve um, the uptake and, and standards in research by sharing methods and tools. So, you know, as scientists, we're not very good at sharing. We write our protocols, we get our grants, we compete for publications. We're getting better at sharing data, but we're not very good at sharing the protocols and the methods that we, um, that we use to do that research. But actually, most things we do in clinical studies are exactly the same. It doesn't matter if we're working on leishmaniasis or HIV or oncology. So what we've been trying to do is set up a mechanism to share tools and resources. So um, Global Health Network that we're, we're, we're running as a sort of large open collaboration has elements like um, clinical um, global health trials within it. And we've got areas for ethics and um, laboratory areas. It's just a platform, it's like an online science park for, for sharing knowledge and, and methods, and that's just trying to make a little bit of an impact on trying to increase research in low-income settings. There we are.